uh, we are going to get started. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Cindy Carl, who is a recent graduate from the MIT Media Lab and will join DEA, which is Design Environmental Analysis, as an assistant professor in uh, January 2019. So, um, as you will see, her work uh, asks a very, seemingly very simple question, which is what happens when wearables become so small and so thin that they can be applied directly on your skin? So, the work is very interesting because it has a, the intersection of many different aspects of what IS um, is interested in. So it's interesting uh, intersection of art, culture, there is a lot of relationships between how we interact with people with our skin, and of course, uh, technology. So it's why I ask uh, Cindy to present her work uh, to uh, see IS uh, audience. And uh, so I wanted to give a little bit of a background for, for Cindy. So I already said that uh, she is um, just by reading from uh, the MIT Media Lab. And she received um, a lot of attention in the press with uh, several awards, uh, both in uh, design, including, I think, your work references at the New York Fashion Show, is that right? And uh, also, she received an award at the South by Southwest Interactive uh, Innovation uh, Competition. Her work was presented in many conferences that uh, go from uh, I Tripoli, Perative Computing, to something which is my, my kind of thing, which is uh, uh, WISP. And she received a award in many of, uh, at many of these conferences. So without further ado, I'd like to present Thank you. So Hire, do I can, can you hear me all right? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so thank you, friends, for a pretty um, introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Cindy. So thanks so much, everyone, for coming. I know it's like 48 hours to the Kai deadline. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, yeah, so I will be joining um, design and environmental analysis in January. So I really am excited to get to see some of the work in the lab, which will be set up by Ben. And so um, then I'll talk about my research practice, which I call hybrid body craft. And so I design interfaces that move directly onto the skin surface, um, but to think about how we can consider also cultural and also aesthetic aspects in creating these devices. So what we see here are two seashells, but these are not merely seashells from nature. They've actually been crafted by the human hand more than 40,000 years ago to be worn as jewelry to decorate the body. So I really think it is a very innate human desire and fascination to use the materials around us to decorate our bodies. And this fascination has only become more vibrant throughout time and space. Here we can see examples um, in which people across various cultures use tattoo and body painting to alter the appearance of their physical body, often not only for decoration, but to also signal belongingness to certain social and cultural groups. We're now at a very exciting place in time where technology has become so miniaturized and slim that we can really start looking at it as a material for crafting our bodies. While for a lot of the developments in this space, they dominantly focus on engineering enhancement, but with less of a dialogue with a greater cultural and social context. I really love this quote from Cynthia Wilson. She is a culture critic. So she really underscores how our bodies are our interface to the external world. And they often encompass not only our individual identities, but also our social, cultural, and even political identities. In my research practice, hybrid body craft, I'm interested in thinking about how, in creating the newest forms of technologies that move directly onto the body, we can create them with greater reference to existing cultural practices. And I really think this relationship between technology and culture should be like a spiral staircase in which they inform and build each other up. So first let's take a look at this really rich space of body craft, so existing way people have been decorating their bodies throughout time. So if we look at a lot of literature and anthropology and also body art, um, I categorize them into a couple main buckets, as we can see here in gray. And under each of these main buckets, there are more specific practices that are adopted within certain cultures or that are designed to be applied on certain body locations. And what I'm showing here is by no means meant to be exhaustive because believe it or not, there are new practices being developed this very day. 
Also, while some practices here are um, today debatable in the talk, we will not pass judgment on them because there's also often cultural and also historical reasons behind their adoption. There are some examples um, of ways people have been decorating their bodies um, in various cultures. So we can really see they often also serve um, belongingness um, to signal belongingness to certain groups. So in looking at this really rich space as a design resource, what I do is um, I extract design parameters from which um, to think about how we can integrate technology. And so two parameters I'd like to talk about today. Um, first is changeability, and second is reach. So what am I talking about in terms of changeability? Um, so when, what this means is when I have this body craft on my body, um, how easy it is for me to alternate between different presentations of stuff. So for example, if today I'm wearing makeup, I can very easily remove my makeup at the end of the day and put on a new form of makeup. So it's a rather mutable and changeable body craft for it. But if today I go under the tattoo gun and bit, get a, a permanent tattoo, um, it's a higher level of commitment. I'm going to be wearing this tattoo for you know much longer periods of time. So it is a much more permanent and immutable body craft form. The second design parameter is reach. So what I'm talking about is when I have this body craft, when I'm wearing this body craft, what is its communicative reach? Um, so um, let's say today I, um, I have a nail art. Because of its very small surface area, you may have to stand right next to me to be able to see it. So it has a very low <coughs> communicative reach. But let's say today I get a whole body tattoo. You might very well be able to see me from even a few miles away. So it has a much higher reach in terms of its communicative cap capabilities. But as we know with all analog body crafts, there is a limit in their communication at the limit of vision. So like when you cannot see me anymore, I lose the capability to, to communicate through my body decoration. But uh, we will see um, through the artifacts I'll introduce in this talk how through the incorporation of technology, we can really um, achieve communicating beyond being there um, through our body art. And so um, placing changeability and reach into a design space, as we can see here, and placing um, the relative um, categories of body craft in their main areas, we can get this design space. And what I'll show in this talk is um, through the de design of various um, artifacts, how technology has the potential and capability to start shifting um, these analog body crafts into previously underexplored um, areas in the design space. And so today, um, I would like to talk about six example research artifacts, um, which, are, which all start by taking inspiration from existing cultural body craft forms. But we explore ways of integrating newer and emerging forms of technology. And so first, looking at the nail art form factor. <coughs> and so in this project, Nail O, um, I was really inspired by the cultural form factor of nail art stickers. They're highly popular in East Asian culture. So think of it as a sticker that you can you know, stick directly onto your fingernails, and it can print really intricate designs. And I saw a resemblance of this form factor um, with flexible electronics. So I was interested in, in exploring the potential of hybridizing this technological form into this body craft. So here is the nail device. So it is essentially a trackpad that sits on your fingertips. We're using capacitive touch sensing so you can apply additional decorative layers on top of it so that it can also be expressive of your personal style. Here's the device working in action. Um, so basically you can pair it with anything with a um, Bluetooth receiver, use it to control your phone or the lights in this room, etc. This is um, the first prototype that we developed using a rigid custom design circuit board. And so we can see that underneath the nail art design layer, um, we have our capacitive sensing electrodes. And all this is powered by a tiny lithium ion battery about the size of your fingernail. And so after creating the first prototype, um, I was interested in manufacturing a version of Flux because we know that our bodies are not rigid, right? They're curved. So um, we worked with factories in Shenzhen to manufacture the second version. And also by taking advantage of this capability, we're able, you were able to create electrodes that were much more complex. So we can see this is a diamond layer interlocking electro design. So the main gestures supported by our device include top-down swipe, left-right, and also press. And we also did um, a software algorithm behind it for the gesture de detection that sits on chip. 
it can achieve 90% accuracy. Um, and in our post-study interviews, um, our participants, they told us that they were they would be interested um, if the device could be further miniaturized so that they could place it on different fingers or to actually have it on multiple fingers so they could like, you know, use that as, as a scroll bar, <laughs> which I think is pretty interesting. So what can you do with a device like this? Um, so I think the first set of interactions include using it as a third hand um, to help you complete um, a task when your hands are busy. So my grandma really likes this um, video. She understand, finally understands what I'm doing. <laughs> the second set of interactions take advantage of this very small and subtle form factor. So for example, you can very discreetly interchange um, between different presentations of the accessory, the clothing you're wearing, or even better, um, when you're in a meeting, get an important text. You can very discreetly reply to it without your advisor knowing. <laughs> And so coming back to this design space, so Nalo is taking inspiration from the nail art form factor, which has a pretty low reach, right, because of its small surface area. You would need to stand next to me to see uh, my nail art. But now by incorporating this interactive capability, I can now communicate to someone on the other side of the world with my body art. So I think this really pushes um, its communicative qualities to the other end of the spectrum. So after this project, I was interested in moving directly onto the skin surface. So um, in this project, dual skin, um, I was really intrigued by these metallic temporary tattoos um, that came out a couple summers ago. So they're basically like these temporary tattoos, temporary stick-on tattoos that kids play with. But they're printed with gold or silver ink. Um, and even Beyonce had her own line, which made them totally legit. Um, so I saw some, and I went online to buy some. and. Like, I, I thought they looked really conductive, so I tested them with the multi, but they were not, because, you know, they were just kind of with ink. Yeah, and so I was interested in a more materials-based hybridization, thinking about how we can also make this type of body craft interactive. So these are some examples of dual skin devices. <coughs> um, so we explore various applications, such as input, output, communication, and some more aesthetic presentations. So, you know, when you're wearing it, it's, it's just the body art, but now, um, also thinking about how we can incorporate extended capabilities. And so this is made possible by the key material of gold metal leaf. Um, it has several desirable qualities. So of course, um, it needs to be conductive. <laughs> and then it's also very aesthetic, right? It has this jewelry, like metallic look. It's also very, it's also skin friendly, mostly composed of copper. So we also have a lot of um, copper-based jewelry. It's also very affordable and accessible. You can buy a pack of Goal leaf, 10 sheets for $10 at your nearest craft store. And so dual skin is actually not one device, but it's designed to be a fabrication process to really enable anyone who is interested to create their own on-skin interfaces. So here I'll briefly walk through the process of creating a dual skin um, device in the example of an NFC tag. And so in the first step, we can use any you know graphic design software to um, draw out um, the circuitry. So here I'm drawing out the, um, the inductive charging coil of the NFC. We can then send this into a electronic cutter. The electronic cutter I'm using here, you can buy online for around 200 bucks. It was, it's normally used by housewives um, to create greeting cards, but now we're just repurposing it to create on-skin interfaces. And so this will cut out like a stencil, as we can see here. And after we have the stencil, we apply the conductive metal leaf layer on top of it. And then we'll remove the negative and then add, and then we can start mounting the corresponding electronic components. So after this step, we will have a, um, a completed um, functional device. Um, and this then takes us to the next step of applying onto skin. So again, through water transfer as we would wear a temporary tattoo. And so to kind of demonstrate what you can do with the application process like this. Um, we explored three um, different types of applications. Um, the first is input. So again, using capacitive touch, turning the skin into an input surface. So this is a one-dimensional slider. And this is a two-dimensional interlocking layer. So with the you know, right supporting software, this can enable, this can support more complex forms of input, such as text input. The second set of devices explore using the skin as a display um, to show information. And I was especially interested in a display-like quality that's more gradual and ink-like, so more like body art, instead of the very binary on a aesthetic of LED. So um, we landed with using this material called thermochromic pigments. So this type of material, uh, when exposed to heat, it will gradually go from one color to the other. 
So underneath this material, we pattern um, resistive traces for fold. So we can see here's an example of a rose tattoo with its outer petals gradually going from one color to the other. And this is a fun application we did. <laughs> so if you pair this with something that can, you know, detect your stress levels and it can detect your like kind of angry or stressed, it'll fire up this moon meter on your arm so your colleagues learn to stay away for a little bit for their own safety. Um, the third set of devices we explored are uh, wireless communication of the NFC. So this is, you know, the technology we have in our um, ID badge and our subway passes. But now thinking about how to very um, um, accessibly fabricate them. Um, so we, we did this demonstration where you can store links to QCAT images on your skin, but I think more importantly to demonstrate the capability to wirelessly store and um, retrieve information on the body surface. And so again, coming back to this design space, um, I think temporary tattoos, um, depending on the amount of coverage on the body, they can have a pretty reasonable communicated reach. But now especially with the first type of application, turning your skin into an input surface, you can now interact with someone on the other side of the world remotely with your body craft. And also looking at the x-axis, um, temporary tattoos are pretty mutable body craft forms, so they usually come off um, within a few couple of days where you can wash it off whenever you want. But now especially with the output application, you can now selectively transition between multiple presentations of self um, within seconds. And so I think in doing this project, I was also interested in thinking about as a researcher how we can really broaden participation to um, cyber-like devices like this. So we also ran a series of workshop studies um, where we had um, people come into our lab and we would teach them to do a skin fabrication process and they would then make their own devices. So here are results from one of our workshop studies. So they were given the task of creating a personalized music player. So we can see here are four different designs by four different people. So really I think every person has a very distinct way in which they would like to express themselves through this technology. So it is interesting for us to think about how we can create on body technologies that really enable higher levels of personalization. I think it's also really interesting for us as researchers to think about how we can, we work in the lab a lot, but also to take our lab into, um, outside of the laboratory and to engage with different industries and communities. And this is what led me to do this collaboration with New York Fashion Week in which we work with um, a really like hipster sensor <laughs> brand called Dine. Um, so we created these custom NFC tags uh, that the models wore on their bodies, and it was a very interactive runway. And so when the models were walking down the runway, the audience could take out their phones and read information from the tags to kind of see how they were designed and what materials they were made of, etc. So these are the custom NFC tags that we did for Dine. So I think it was a very interesting um, deployment <coughs> research experiment for me to see how to take like an emerging form of technology into the fashion industry. Next, I'll talk about a extension um, of the output <coughs> application, but applied to the face. So this is meant to be a color changing eyeshadow. So for example, if today you're at work, it can be um, you know, an earth tone, more neutral color, but later in the evening when you go out to party, it can change the neon color automatically. And so um, let's see, let's take a look at this. They're supposed to be nice music, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, and we, we tested it and it was working perfect. Yes, until the actual time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's very slow, but it has like kind of this gradual change from one color to the other. Yeah, so if you want to hear like the like the rock music that goes with this, you can. <laughs> and so um, next we'll look at a, a project which also explores a more specific body location, so um, the hand. So um, in this project, Skimware, I was really intrigued by this emerging body art form of hand art, and especially wire or thread-based hand art, where um, these body artists, they would place these decorative wires or threads on hands or fingernails for aesthetic decoration, but also thinking about how we can also work with interactive capabilities. And so I really think our hands are a very interesting body location. 
because they're extremely dexterous and they help us complete so many tasks within a day. And so I think it really comes as no surprise that the wearable computing community over the past 30 years have been, has been fascinated with placing all different sorts of sensors on hands and finger joints. Um, but we, we can see that there are certain limitations. So first of all is the form factor. And this is you know very much due to the challenge of placing so many fingers on a very limited surface area and then wiring each of these sensors to a central microprocessor that usually sits at the wrist. Um, so this does constrain the dexterity of the hand. Um, and another is, so none of us wear gloves, right, in a day-to-day -day setting. So there also is this issue around social acceptance and for wider adoption. And so in this project skim where I was interested in thinking about how um, by taking inference from this very intricate body craft form of um, body wiring, we can start moving these interfaces from a glove-based form factor directly onto the skin. And also to explore possibilities for more aesthetic customization for the expression of one's identity. And so um, we'll demonstrate um, the fabrication process. We created an example of a um, index and thumb based um, hand gestural interface. Um, so we'll place an IME sensor on the tips and ends of the index finger and the thumb, and all this is connected to a central microprocessing brain um, at the wrist. And so the main tool um, we're taking advantage of um, is, is the humble sewing machine, which you can probably get from your grandma. Um, but the materials we're feeding into this machine are unique. Um, so the thread we're feeding in is actually very thin, braided magnet wires. And by braiding them together, um, really enables us to um, significantly lower the complexity when they're spread out on the body surface. And we would then sew um, this, um, this mag magnetic thread onto something I like to call skin cloth. So it is a material that we custom made that's a very thin silicone layer. And underneath is an embody stabilizer layer so that when you feed it through the sewing machine, um, it will not rip. And so our three-step fabrication process, so first, again, sketching out the placement of the traces um, on the body surface. And then we would then feed um, the skin cloth um, into the sewing machine, um, sewing on the conductive traces. So these are uh, more details on this step. And we also use a, zig a zigzag trace because it is known and the textile that um, zigzag traces enable much more stretch and flexibility than worn on the body. And so after we have the traces, we then go to the next step of incorporating electronics. So these are all the IME sensors and also the microprocessor unit. And all of these sensors are also manufactured in flex, so it will be more conformable um, to the curvature of the body. And you know, our last and favorite step, apply it onto the skin, and we can again do this um, through water transfer. And so this is the resulting device. So it's a fully self-contained um, skin-based um, hand gesture interface. Um, so you know you can really couple this with different forms of body. Here we're coupling it with you know nice butterfly tattoos and customize it to different colors for so that it really goes with um, what you wear on a day-to-day -day basis. We also did a form factor wearability study where we had people wear this form factor for a day to uncover issues around comfort, wearability, and also just the social perception of wearing something like this in the wild. So this is the um, <coughs> this is a working demo of the device. Um, so um, we have a, like, you know, you see my sleeve here because we want to show that there's nothing hiding up the sleeve. <laughs> so it's a fully self-contained um, skin-based interface. So I think hand art um, is, again, it has a pretty limited reach because of its low surface area um, on the body, but again, by incorporating these interactive capabilities, you can then manipulate, communicate with someone remotely with your hand on it. These next two projects I like to talk about, um, they look at a more primitive form factor, such as in powders or cream. And although they are, um, we would say, more basic, I think they're the most natural way we have in decorating our bodies throughout time. And so in this project, <coughs> I was interested in looking at the body craft of cosmetic powders. And thinking about how we can, you know, start augmenting um, wearables um, on a more micro level, so really using chemical engineering to alter the performance of these chemical sensitive powders. And so in earth tones, um, I was really interested in thinking about how something on the body scale can help us reflect um, information about something more on the environmental scale. So we developed a series of powders um, that they would be a percent elevated levels of environmental hazard, and then have a corresponding color change to inform the wear of elevated levels. 
And I think also from a more interaction perspective, thinking about how a more passive practice, um, such as wearing these cosmetic powders, how can we augment it to become more active? So the first set of powders we develop are a carbon monoxide experience. So this color experience is um, more saturation based from a lighter color to much darker when exposed to elevated levels. Um, so chemistry 101, <laughs> here we go. And so we're taking advantage of uh, a palladium 2 complex. So when it's exposed to carbon monoxide, um, it generates this color change from yellow um, to brown and eventually black. So this you know, saturation based color change. And then you can also, you can also you know, mix it with different um, <coughs> cosmetic powders so it can have more customized color tones. The second set of powders we develop are our ultraviolet experience. So this is a more spectrum change, color change from you know yellow to orange and then gradually to dark red. And so uh, will the color come back like No, it's irreversible. Okay. Yeah. So you would then it's kind of you would just wash it off. And so um, we're taking advantage of a two-layer um, UV acid generator reaction. So when it's, it's exposed to higher amounts of um, UV, um, it will release more acid, which acid will then react with a dye that generates this um, you know, very gradual shift in color. And so the last set of powders we develop are our ozone experience. Um, so this is a more um, drastic color change from much lighter to much darker. And so we're using a, the reaction of a potassium iodine complex. Um, and so when exposed to um, elevated amounts of ozone, it will gradually go from this more milky white to much darker um, purple blue. And so we also did an exploratory user study where we had participants wear skin safe versions um, of this prototype to kind of understand um, user perceptions towards a form factor like this. And what we found was um, people, they saw these powders as a more um, a softer display um, and more <coughs> integrated the body as compared to, in their words, um, the harsher quality of digital displays. Um, we also found that our participants, they have you know, a wide range of preferred body locations to wear this. So for um, people who wear makeup on a day-to-day -day basis, they would like to apply it you know, onto their face as makeup. Um, as like a fashion statement that they're environmentally conscious, environmentally woke. Um, but like for people who do not wear makeup, they prefer different body locations such as you know, their arms or legs or even more inconspicuous areas such as your inner wrist. So kind of like the place where we have a lot of our skin washes. They're also interested in integrating um, the powders into temporary tattoos, the creams they use, their nail polish. So again, kind of contrasting this to the more fixed form factor um, of smartwatches. So makeup is a, you know, like a very mutable body craft form. Bathrooms where they used to be called powder rooms because you know you can go in and touch up your makeup every couple of hours. But now by augmenting the chemical level, um, you can really alternate between different presentations um, again within seconds. Next let's take a look at the gel form factor. And so in Skin Morph, I was really inspired <laughs> by these gel face masks. Um, but thinking about um, how we can also think about augmenting them um, more from a material science perspective. Um, so Skin Morph, um, this is a texture tunable um, skin interface so it can selectively transition between soft and rigid. Um, so I think um, we're really thinking about how we can design skin as armor, as an interactive piece of armor um, to protect the wear when they're engaging in different activities. And this is made possible by the material design of smart hydrophilic gels. So these gels, um, in room temperature, um, they become swollen. Um, they love to attract water. So this makes them soft and they're also clear in this state. However, when they become thermally activated, they engage in a hydrophobic interaction where they start pushing out a lot of water. And this is what causes them to become stiff and they're also white in this state. And so this is a reversible um, interaction. Um, so um, we encapsulated them into a on-scan form factor through a fabrication process, um, then taking advantage of very thin layers of silicon. But the top layer of the silicon is embedded with resistive heating traces and connected to a custom design circuit board um, so to trigger um, an increase or decrease in heat to activate the gel. And so thinking about um, applications in which um, it would make sense to have our skin serve as a piece of interactive armor, um, we first um, explored 
um, the carpal tunnel syndrome. So thinking about how we can have, uh, how we can you know, map out a wearer's uh, pain profile and have a customized carpal tunnel splint that can really support them even when they're engaging in different gestures and activities. And also using it as a protective layer um, for engaging in high impact activities, especially to protect um, our joints. And for anyone who has worn uncomfortable shoes before, <laughs> so to use it as, you know, very um, customized um, padding. So whether I'm walking up a hill, down a hill, sitting or standing, it can provide just the right amount of support. So again, I think gels are pretty mutable body craft forms, but now also by augmenting them, this time out of, from a material science perspective, they have also become much more mutable. So this last project I'd like to talk about um, takes advantage of the jewelry form factor. This moves a little bit more away from the skin, but I think you know jewelry and accessories <coughs> are the most prevalent form factor in the wearable computing market today. Um, so I was interested in thinking about what are some capabilities that are underexplored. So I was really intrigued by this cultural form factor, the macaque beetle. Um, so this is from Mexico. So what they do is they take living beetles and they bedazzle them and you can then, you know, pet it onto your shirt and they would literally walk around as a piece of living jewelry. And so I think um, exploring this concept of incorporating mobility into traditionally static um, device, um, decorations that we have on our clothes. And so Kino is our rendition of a visualized hopefully more sustainable <laughs> version of a living jewelry. And a lot, of the inner, and a lot of the initial effort went into engineering these miniaturized robots that are able to freely um, roam on fabric. And this is mostly made possible by the mechanical, mechanical design of, these magnetic, of this magnetic wheel drive that really enables it to cling onto fabric and also to move up and defy gravity when in motion. And so looking at these um, robots as a material design, and exploring the different form factors it can take um, by attaching different <coughs> covers and also the different type of movements it can have on the body. And also thinking about um, and incorporating different sensors and actuators and, and sensing what are what, what are all the multitudes of um, interactions it can have. And so to kind of explore this design space, um, we developed um, a series of applications which we'll see in this video. Um, it also has really nice music. so. Check it out online. <laughs> yeah. What's the layer? <laughs> So we're using velvet here and you know, depending on the direction you kind of move, move it in, it can have different signs. And so this is actually, because we can't hear the sound, um, when it crawls up, it becomes a speaker. So when you're just wearing it, it's um, just decorative, but it can transition. And so after we develop these applications, everyone was like, great, but why would someone want to wear something like that? Which I think is a really good question. Um, so this led us to do some workshop studies to understand people's perception towards the novelty of our clothes. Um, what we found was that um, when people, they initially encountered <laughs> um, they saw it as being a little bit eerie, um, but after they were actually able to wear it and kind of envision some more useful applications, um, with something like this, they start to, you know, see potential for it to be kind of like a personal assistant. So what we found was important is that the movement of the device on the body needs to be purposeful um, for it to be seen as useful. Our participants, they also mentioned a wide range of um, user interactions that they could see themselves doing with a device like this. So ranging from the more aesthetic centric, using it as a communication, remote communication device, and also with a more functional sense. And so jewelry is also a pretty mutable body craft form. So you can change the jewelry you're wearing every couple of days. But now with extended mobility, you can alternate um, between the aesthetic presentation of the jewelry within seconds. 
And so I think um, in talking about these six um, example research artifacts, um, which are all inspired um, by cultural buying platforms, I hope to provide a lens into the really rich design potential and taking inspiration from um, body crafts. But we can also see how technology has also hand in hand really brought forth, um, extended um, and unprecedented um, capabilities for these analog body crafts. And so it's kind of um, um, taking a, a look back at um, the, the shifts in this design space. So first looking at the shift in changeability. So we can see that you know interactive technology has made um, these body crafts much more mutable. So they really enable a person to really switch and alternate between multiple sides of themselves within a day. And so now that we have this much higher control to alter our um, presentation of self to the world, who do we want to give this control to? I think this is an interesting question to think about. So what I like to, so let's say today I have color changing makeup. Would I like to be the one con controlling my makeup or, or would I like to give up this control to somebody else so I can appear um, appealing to their preference? Or would I like my makeup to reflect something about something on an architectural or environmental scale? So I think these are some interesting questions for us to start thinking about um, for this possible future. And looking at the, um, the shift in communicative reach, so um, an active technology has really enabled um, you know, us to communicate beyond being there very generally and broadly in all aspects of our life. Um, so we are really no longer limited to communicating through vision, through passive visibility, um, but really to communicate um, remotely through the things um, we adorn ourselves with. And so I think um, what we can see is that technology has the capability to really increase um, the agency for us to alter and communicate our identity. And I think this really um, brings for a lot of opportunities um, for, you know, for us to go from being fixed to one identity, but instead to be able to translate between multiple identities um, throughout our lifetime. And I think this also really goes hand in hand um, with our contemporary times. Right? Maybe in our great grandfather's times, a person would be born in one country and they would probably, you know, live their entire lives in that same country. So they would carry on one identity from start to beginning. But nowadays, due to mass mobility and globalization, it is very, very common for a person to <coughs> and live in many different places and take on multiple identities throughout their lifetime. So I really think it is the power of technology um, to really enable this um, extended level um, of the personalization of one's identity. And so um, where do we go from here? And so next I would like to um, give a very quick overview um, of some possible future directions um, that I think are, are interesting to explore. There's four things I'd like to talk about. So I think first, um, looking at technology as a material for design. So as we can see um, in these various um, artifacts that I've worked with, um, so when I started with um, form factors such as jewelry or accessories, um, this would require um, technological hybridization more on the macro level as in mechanical engineering and, and electrical engineering. But as these form factors started to move closer and closer directly onto the skin, this started to require more micro level technologies such as material fabrication and also chemical engineering. I think it's in the future, it's also very interesting for us to think about how we can move towards the nano level and to explore um, even more organic um, form factors um, because I think these are really the most natural ways in which we have been altering and decorating our bodies throughout time. And next, um, designing ecological skin. So um, the fashion industry is one of the highest polluting industries in the world. And so also in designing technology for the body, how can we be more um, environmentally aware from the very beginning? So in designing these devices, um, are there some options in using sustainable or even biodegradable materials and also to even explore options um, for self-powered wearables? It's also really interesting to think about how to design across scales. So I think the word skin is very interesting. Skin can refer to something on the body scale, but we know there are also architectural skins and also natural skins, such as the tree, the, the skin of trees, tree barks, and also the skin of animals. So um, while I am interested in you know, initiating from body scale skin, it's interesting to think about different types of interactions we can have with both man-made and natural environments. 
it's also very interesting, I think, as researchers to think about how we can democratize these processes. Um, so after the DuoScan project was released, um, I started to get emails from people I never met before. And they told me they basically, you know, they read the paper and they followed the fabrication process. And they were able to create their own DuoScan device. Um, so we can see here on the um, top right, these are actually students from the Stewart Elementary School. And so he created this on-skin selfie button, which I think is very useful. And so I think it's um, interesting to think about how we can start creating construction kits around skin te technologies to really broaden participation towards this cyborg future. And so Skinduino is a very initial exploration we did. Um, so it's an Arduino variant um, to enable really quick plug and play to create on-skin touch sensors. So we also um, used this during a course we ran at MIT and students were able to much um, more rapidly um, prototype um, body-based interfaces. I think um, in thinking about democratizing these devices, it's important to also explore how we can enable higher levels of personalization and self-expression. And so um, this is the color changing eyeshadow project. And what we did was um, we had this um, demonstration at Kai, and we actually made a hundred of these devices and we just let anyone who was interested try them on. And we can really see that each person has a very different way in which they would like to express themselves through this technology. So how can we really think about designing on-body um, interfaces more as materials instead of a standalone device? I think as um, designers, researchers, and makers, um, how can we more, be more inclusive in the way we think and the way we make? Um, so when I started to you know, work on a lot of these on-body interfaces, I needed a lot of body parts to prototype with. So I went online to try to buy some mannequins, but all I could find were mannequins of the same skin tone. But we know that does not reflect reality, and this is also why later on we also developed this process to um, customize mannequin arms into different skin tones. So we can start trying to understand how these emerging forms of technologies will look on people from different backgrounds. So while I don't think this is a perfect solution to this problem, but I think as researchers, um, it is very important for us to start thinking about how we can contribute to this complex issue. I think there's also a lot of cultural considerations to be uncovered for on-body interfaces. So in the example of dual skin, um, I had the opportunity to engage with some women from Middle Eastern countries, and they told me that while they thought the idea was interesting, um, this was not something they could wear back in their home countries because the gold or silver aesthetic would be seen as too flashy for women to wear. However, they told me um, if we could adjust and adapt the design to more resemble a henna-like practice, and because henna is a culturally embedded and familiar body craft, then they could see a higher potential for its adoption. So I think there's a lot of um, cultural nuances and sensitivities that are really worth uncovering um, for these interfaces to become much more inclusive in their design. So I like to end my talk on this quote from Alison Leary, which I think is fitting because I just found out this morning she's a Cornell faculty. <laughs> she must be right. <laughs> and so um, I really think fashion is a very powerful tool for communication and probably one of the most vibrant tools for nonverbal communication. It is the hope of my work that in bridging the newest and most emerging forms of technology with the richness of cultural body crafts that we can really start thinking about how we can design interfaces that really enable each individual um, to express the multitudes of their unique identities to the rest of the world. <coughs> so last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators across each of these research projects. As you can see, they span many disciplines, and I think it is one of the greatest privileges and most exciting things of a hybrid body craft researcher to get able to work with people crossing so many different um, um, expertise. And so, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. We do, in fact, have a reasonable amount of time for questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Can you be on my PhD committee? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking, because right now, I'm developing a material that is self-powered, that, um, Detects like uh, toxins in the air, and you would be perfect. Oh, those are real time. Those are real time. So 
where we program them to move in certain ways. Yeah, but those are real time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, design technology, which is you know socially probably very really important, also you bring up that point. Uh, but actually, so uh, for your technology, do you actually explore like people's perception of this technology? Like people may be fine to put their tattoo on for special scenarios, but how far away are we from you know put this thing on daily daily activities? You can wear that every day, and how far away from you know we are from there? And you, you know, people are evolving, but in your perspective, how far? Away? Yeah, and so, well, as you can see, like, um, most of my research in the past, you know, I pictured it, it more, more, mostly about building prototypes, but as I built these prototypes, a lot of these design implications are always an important to study these issues, right? And so, but, you know, these studies, they often, and a challenge with actually deploying <coughs> a lot of these emerging forms of technology into the wild is that they are prototypes, right? And so they break. So it's very hard to deploy them for extended amounts of time. From the best of my knowledge, the longest user study um, on an onto the interface is actually from the CMR project that I just saw, where we had people wear it for eight hours. And well, that was the longest. Um, so, um, but I do think that with these type of studies, it doesn't need to be functional. Right? <laughs> it can be very form factor based, and then you can really, um, you know, I think there there is this question of you know the preference of, of people of different genders, and there's also this other dimension of people from different cultural backgrounds, right? There are a lot of different cultural nuances and sensitivities. And so uh, I won't bore everyone with my PhD thesis, but you know, actually, we really talk, I really talk about how there really can be an added dimension into the matrix with on cultural sensitivity. So for example, today I'm designing for Japanese culture versus an American culture, like the, like the, um, like the design space would be slightly different. Yeah, but I think it's a really great question and very interesting. Uh, research space to start getting in. Yep. I have a very basic question and not one that I thought I would ever ask. What about sweat? Like yeah. what happens to these uh, devices when there's sweat involved? Yeah, so um, you know when people sweat, when people move around more often, um, then you know they they stop working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So for example, like you know with dual skin we tested them like um, with normal activity, you can wear them for eight hours. But you know, if, if you're if you're wearing one of these and you're going into the shop using like you know like the three axis like milling machine, it's probably going to only last for three to four hours, right? And so, um, I think it's a really interesting question. And you know, I had the opportunity to talk to John Rogers. So he was one of the first people coming from a very engineering centric perspective, industrial centric, who created the first. He calls them epidural electrons. And so I asked him like. So what is the longest lifetime? And he said two weeks. And I said, oh, why? And he said it's because it's not because of um, the limit of technology; it's the limit of human biology. So he was saying that like in every two weeks, our skin has a new, um, do kind of like a regeneration cycle, and it will create a lot of um, waste on the skin, and that will even cause his devices to start falling off. So you know, it is possible to maybe have an underneath layer, a chemical sensor that can you know kind of react with the um, skin waste so that it can last longer, et cetera. But you know, the, it is a it is a very interesting but also challenging uh, research question. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah. So thank you for your super engaging presentation. Thank first. you. Um, so you introduced the changeability on the reach yeah. as yeah two parameters of mm -hmm. Minecraft design. Yeah. And are there any different parameters we can actually consider? Yeah, so there's actually a ton of <laughs> different parameters. Yeah. So, um, uh, but I, yeah, why I you talk decided about to this. focus on these two? Yeah, so I talked about this more um, in my thesis, and I examined them. But I think today, for the sake of time, yeah. um, I think these are the two parameters that we can really see the effect of technology. Yeah, and, it, and it's also more like a design implication that after I really plotted this and examined it, that you can see this is the kind of the effect of technology on these body interfaces. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So kind of building on an earlier question, um, a lot of the sort of on-skin traditional things you're talking about, like temporary tattoos, fail really gracefully, right? It fades away slowly, your fingernails don't just suddenly become undecorated. Yeah. Um, whereas these technologies, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like they kind of fail instantly. Um, do you get any sense from your studies how people react to sort of technology being transient, transient in the way that you know nail polish is transient? Um, they actually. 
from our studies, people actually prefer the use of on-skin devices yeah. to be a trans man. Because, you know, um, you know, when you think about it, today I, I'm telling you I'm going to put this chip on your skin permanently. <coughs> you might have to think twice, but if today I tell you it's, it's just going to be for three days, and you'll be like, oh, why not try it? So I think there's a playful nature and it being more sophisticated, and I think society and, you know, the general public is also at a level where they're kind of intrigued by these devices, but also suspicious. But I think, you know, as researchers, getting them to kind of engage with something like this and to broaden the discussion. Can I just follow up with one quick yeah. thing? Have you worked at all with the body mod community who are maybe more friendly with permanent yeah, body change? Yeah, we've got a lot of <laughs> contacts with the body mod community. Um, yeah, and so body mod is interesting because it moves inside the body, mm -hmm. right? Piercings kind of still on the body, uh, but a lot of it moves inside the body. And I kind of position my work kind of at this edge where technology is so close, but it's still on the body that you can see it. And therefore, we can also explore the expressive and also more um, like sociology, fashion theory perspectives. But I think, you know, that is where it's moving. And um, even when things move underneath the skin, as the body mind community is very comfortable with, you know, we can still explore, you know, like, different type of textures on the skin, that is so visible, right? But it's just um, an area that um, I think is, I haven't gotten into, but it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But maybe this is similar to, to Jay's question, but I'm not sure. Um, have you explored ways that you could increase communicability, like or increase reach that aren't visual, but through a different mode? Like, I guess your jewelry example with the speaker probably would be one example of that. But even thinking about two people wearing devices and being able to transmit information between them, that's more tactile. Yeah, um, definitely. So I think, um, so you know, I think, so it's kind of like it's kind of more in the lines of the Skimmorph project. But Skimmorph is an output, but you know, if you have something that's more of a tactile <laughs> input, um, you can, you know, two people could be wearing it very easily. This goes into applications more for the sex industry, but yeah, of course, there's a lot of applications there, but um, yeah, in different ways of communicating. But I think the power of kind of, you know, body separation, you communicate non-verbally through people seeing it. Yeah, but I think it's still an interesting... Can't communicate? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think there's a... I think it's yeah, it's really yeah, so I think it's very interesting, you know, to apply this to the, like, to assistive technologies, right? Um, so I think, you know, for, <coughs> for you know, we got a lot of interest from people who we're paralyzed, right? So because it really enables you to engage um, more largely with your surrounding environment or devices for very small movement. And so I think, you know, that's a very interesting um, population to engage with, but um, it's just less of a focus of my research because I think it's a very specific research space. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you for your speaker again.